But we begin tonight with the single most unexpected turn of events yet in the fight over health reform. The scene was the final day of the D.C. Conference of America's Health Insurance Plans. You'll remember America's Health Insurance Plans as the insurance industry group that released a widely ridiculed study last week in which the insurers threatened that in the event of health reform passing, they would hike everyone's rates sky high as opposed to what they're doing now. At the podium today was Republican pollster Bill McInturf, who does poll for the NBC Wall Street Journal polls and whose work over the years for the health insurance industry has included the infamous Harry and Louise ads that are widely credited with scaring the public out of supporting health reform the last time around in 1993. Now, while Bill McInturf was standing at the podium today at the AHIP conference, he was interrupted in a strange way. Somebody shouted from the floor of this health insurance industry conference, thank you for all the good work you do. And then, what, what, I, all I can say is that the fight against the health insurance industry and for health reform in America suddenly, in real time, got really, really weird and surprising. Watch this. Uh, all right, so kind of trying to put in perspective, where are we? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not getting paid today, so I think the AF staff is, uh, is in the back trying to provide psychic compensation. Thank you. No, 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 no. That wasn't the AHIP staff interrupting you, sir. Turn back now while you still have the chance. I think the AF staff is, uh, is in the back trying to provide psychic compensation. Thank you. Obviously, they were the billionaires for wealth care, again. The satirists who cheerfully and in really good tone nailed the health insurance industry today for opposing health reform. They honestly said, if we get a public option, we can s sniff out waste just like a Dawson. <laughs> I have a degree in health policy, and I have to tell you, I've never been more happy talking about health care in my life than I am right now with the Dawson quote. The billionaires for wealth care describe themselves as a grassroots network of health insurance CEOs, HMO lobbyists, talk show hosts, and others profiting off our broken health care system. The billionaires for wealth care, well-sung guerrilla musical satirical attack on the insurance industry today was, ju it was, was just one sign among many of continued spunk and energy on the left to push for a robust version of reform. MoveOn.org, the Campaign for America's Future, and the NAACP today wrote directly to the White House Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, to, quote, respectfully ask that the office of the president take a stronger stand on a robust public option in order to enact true health care reform this year. In case that was unclear, the groups added that the president should, quote, heed the will of the people and the organized progressive grassroots and take a strong leadership position in support of a robust public option. 
In response to conflicting reports today on the current whip count in both houses of Congress for a robust public option, the left is also flexing its muscles online, with influential websites like Daily Kos encouraging its readers to whip the vote themselves by lobbying elected Democrats to commit to votes in favor of a robust public option right now. Joining us now is Christopher Hayes. He's Washington editor of The Nation magazine. Chris, it's nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's great to be back, Rachel. You'll be expected to sing all of your answers this evening. I, <laughs> hope somebody I, you wish, about that. I wish I could sing like that. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like one thing to be really good at satire. It's another thing to be I really know, brave about the personal confrontation. It's another thing to be able to do it in perfect operatic four-part harmony. Amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Chris, a lot, a lot of today's reporting on health reform was that maddening stuff where everybody's claiming something different yep. about the vote counts and which kind of public option will ultimately live. Everybody's citing unnamed sources. Uh, from your reporting, can you tell us what form of legislation seems to be gaining ground in Congress and which is losing ground? Okay, so uh, here's here's where things stand as far as I can tell. I talked to some people today who who are kind of in conversations with the White House. On on the House side, there's going to be a public option in the House bill. The question is how strong it is. The robust public option, which term is being used by by a lot of people, uh, the sort of strongest version of it is a public option in which the the payment rates to doctors and hospitals is set at Medicare plus five percent, and that's that's that would be the absolute sort of strongest version of the of the plan, and it's unclear right now that the whip count that you showed from Daily Coast earlier today, the whip count is to get that version of the public option on the House side. Now, even if they don't have that, they'll have a slightly weaker version of it, but there will definitely be a public option in the House version. The question on the Senate side, what I'm hearing, is that there are 58 votes right now on the Senate side uh, for the opt-out version. The opt-out version, remember, is the one in which everybody starts out with a public option in every state, and states then can opt out of that. Um, most likely what you end up with is essentially the big blue states and blue states in general having an, a public option, red states not having it. The hope being that once you've instantiated it up front, and it shows, uh, you know, it keeps costs down, people like it, then you get it towards the end. So that's where things are as far as I can tell uh, in the two houses. On the issue <laughs> of the, the Senate, you're saying 58 votes for an opt-out version of a public yes. option in the Senate. Right. 58 votes is, is way more than a majority. Um, Senator Reid obviously is still trying for 60 votes. There's only a 60-vote yes. threshold if a Democrat sides with Republicans to filibuster health reform. But yet that is not, the, that is not central in D.C. to the analysis of what's going to happen in the Senate, is it? No, and it's really frustrating. I mean, there's two issues here. One is that, look, if you can't keep if you cannot prevent Democratic senators from filibusting their own party's central priority, the president's, the thing the president ran on of the member of their party, if you can't get them to at least let that bill come to the floor for a vote and not join the opposition party's filibuster, it's really a question of why you have a, a political party. I mean, honestly, this is like the threshold baseline level of party loyalty, that you at least allow a vote on the floor. So, in some senses, it should be academic. I mean, there should be 60 votes to break a filibuster for whatever the, the, the leadership wants to bring to the floor. Unfortunately, that's not the case right now. Does the fact that Harry Reid is looking for 60 votes, that he's let it be known today that he's got 58 and he needs two more, does that mean that he expects somebody will cross over? Is he essentially giving that up? You'd think the thing they'd be whipping right now is cloture, that there be a 50 vote yes. threshold. I think they're trying to put pressure on the holdouts. No one knows exactly who the holdouts are. The, the two names I heard most today were Landrew and Ben, Mary Landrew from Louisiana, Ben Nelson from Nebraska. I think by saying it's at 58, it, it's one way of trying to put pressure on them. I mean, the other the other thing that, that that's in play here right now is where the White House is in all of this. Yes. And right now, there there there's a lot of frustration from people that the White House is not playing a particularly productive role in in sort of being the tipping point uh, in, in the in the Senate side of things. Well, is that potentially strategery at work? Is it possible that the White <laughs> House, I mean, Valerie Jarrett said on MSNBC this morning that the president is committed right. to a public option. Is it possible that the White House is not putting the president out as the spokesperson for the public option because they think it would be helpful to the likelihood of the public option ultimately passing that it not be identified with him? 
That seems unlikely to me. I mean, I think the more the more likely explanation is that they are very focused on on this being a bipartisan bill. As ludicrous as that sounds, when you <laughs> consider that the best hope they have is one Republican vote in both houses, right? In in the totality of however many Republican legislators there are, you know, three hundred or something like that, that that they're going to get you know one of those people to vote, and that's Olympia Snow. And so you know, there's a there's a I think a, a, a strain within the White House that thinks. Let's just kind of give Olympia Snow what she wants so we could then, at the end of the day, say the president passed a bipartisan bill. But that's crazy, right? Because the trigger option that Snow is proposing, almost no one. I mean, you literally can't find a single person who thinks it's a good idea. It, 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 it's, it's, it's the kind of worst sausage making at its worst. Chris Hayes, Washington editor of The Nation. I think you and I should start a campaign that it be called bipartisan because Bernie Sanders is going to vote for it. And yes, he is, after right. all, an independent socialist. That's exactly right. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Have a great weekend. Thank you.